free to say hello if you want to as well. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> there he is on California time. Uh, so uh, we are two of the current members of the Human Anatomy Program team. Um, and we've been uh, working away, chipping away at this um, Chancellor's Chair for Teaching Excellence grant for, for three years now. This is our, our sort of end, uh, end point, as it were. So we've got uh, a, a lot of interesting and fun things that we managed to accomplish. Uh, so we're really happy to be able to share them. Um, first of all, I just want to acknowledge the rest of our team members. Not everyone can make it. So uh, Sean Baudet uh, from Kinesiology, Becca McPherson from Health Sci, uh, Parker Holman also from Kinesiology, uh, and, and the two of us. Uh, some of us slightly more, more bearded, a little more salt with the pepper, uh, but you know, we're still here. We're, we're still, we're still moving forward. Um, we also had numerous other members. Dr. Mazil uh, has moved on. Uh, she was one of the original recipients of the award and, 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 and she got offered uh, an assistant professor position at McMaster. So she's still in the same building, just in, under a different banner and everything else is the weirdest thing. I can still go, I can still talk to her, still update her on things. Um, and of course, our, our students who who graduated uh, after completing their 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 time served, I suppose you could say. So um, a lot of our objectives for this um, project, as it were, uh, and we and we thought of this as a, as a sort of large project that sort of built on these components. Um, you know, one of our big things was how how does being like, you know, I, I guess an online learner, maybe a hybrid, maybe in person, how does this impact how people learn anatomy? Because anatomy, we're used to very, very much a tangible thing, working with cadavers, models, specimens, switching over to an online environment as we did when we, we sort of first pitched this idea. Um, I was like, how's this going to work? Um, so that was something that we wanted to explore. We also wanted to look at how our, our own um, sort of techniques, our own methodology, how that uh, was able to essentially alter what people were learning. Um, and we wanted to explore our volunteer program. Our volunteer program is a pretty big deal. Nick, who, who was a volunteer during his undergrad studies uh, and then did his honors thesis, essentially as part of uh, the chancellor's chair. Um, you know, these volunteers who come into the lab as peer educators, how does this sort of help them kind of learn anatomy more? What about the students? Do they benefit from anything? So we had a, like a lot of questions about essentially how can we teach anatomy to be better? How can we sort of utilize all these resources and different methods to, to get better outcomes? Um, so I'll let Nick uh, talk a little bit about what we've been up to, sort of summarize everything here. Yeah, so over these past couple of years, we've managed to get a couple of projects done uh, related to the things that Martin was just discussing. Some of them uh, we have like the previous undergraduate thesis students that we're involved with, and then some that we've had like overlap with that I've become involved with. So for the first project, we were kind of looking, actually I'll just move forward so we can go through each slide. Um, so through 2021, we had like our first undergraduate thesis uh, project that occurred. So that one was actually looking at different perceptions that are based from student experiences in the labs as volunteers. And those ones we kind of wanted to, I wasn't involved with this, but from my understanding of it, we wanted to understand how these peer experiences, being volunteers in the anatomy lab, actually impact their perceptions of it compared from in-person experiences to virtual experiences and see if there's any overlap that exists between the two. Um, then we want to see how that impacts their interest in it and see whether, yeah, there's any differences that come from that. So some of the things that we had found while we were looking at it were that they had pretty similar experiences in terms of growing their interest in anatomy. As you can see, there's a lot of overlap between the two scores on the Likert scale, between the in-person and the virtual experiences. There's probably minimal difference there, uh, as well as in terms of the overlapping terms, there's a lot related to like career, knowledge, et cetera, that is very important for people that are like establishing their careers as they're finishing undergrad. And then we saw a couple different ones that appeared between the in-person and virtual experiences, likely because of the differences in terms of those students' experiences in terms of what they could actually do within the settings. Because one, you're actually in the labs at Brock, whereas the one you're just restricted to teams and having access to like the PowerPoint, online resources like Visible Body, Practice Anatomy Lab, those types of things. So you're kind of doing your best you can with those tools without actually being able to have like the tangible plastic models or cadaver specimens. 
so then also in 2021 we had our i don't know if you want to expand on this martin but uh the inaugural anatomy symposium yeah i can talk a little bit more about this since uh I had to chair it. Um, we, uh, in in light of everything that was going on, we thought it was important to to sort of share what we've been up to. Um, so again, sort of using this 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 opportunity, um, let's talk about our work. Let's share it. Let's try to organize some people who might be interested in some of the things that we're talking about. Um, and this was more or less geared towards current students and people who wanted to be volunteers, people who were volunteers, and we're sort of sharing. Hey, here's here's what the anatomy program is up to. Um, and we had a lot of interest. Um, I, th I think we had something like 80 online participants. So it was it was great. We, we sort of spread it out to other members in different faculties. Some people joined. Um, we recorded it. It's still available up on YouTube. Um, and we've gotten some views on it and stuff too. People were interested. So it was it was a nice way to sort of showcase what we've been up to so far, what we had planned um, and, and sort of what we were learning uh, as we were conducting some of this research into some of those preferences. So that was our sort of first foray and 2022, um, you know, continuing on with some of the challenges, um, particularly in, in this um, sort of new set of undergraduate students that we we had to sort of brought onto the team. Um, we wanted to investigate some of those differences between undergraduate, um, you know, human anatomy learning preferences. So basically in an online, in-person and, and hybrid sort of components and you know, people who took anatomy and only did it online versus people who did part of it online, part of it in person. Um, you know, how did it affect their skills? Uh, did they feel or did they at least perceive that their skills were, were sort of better after being in one cohort versus the other? Um, what about their emotional competencies and, and how does this affect their career aspirations? Did they feel by taking something and, and only having it online, were they worse off? Were they better off because they had it in person? And, and those kinds of aspects. So, um, Nick, you know, I, I think you did a lot of work on this, so I want you to make sure to 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 to, to explain this because I think you do it quite well. Yeah. So one of the major things that we looked at when we were exploring these differences between the skill set development, emotional competencies, and career aspirations was the differences, like Martin said, between in person and online experiences. So we ended up actually breaking those down into traditional versus hybrid experiences because the traditional one would just be like purely in person or purely online, whereas the hybrid is we're discussing those experiences that they had in the in-person component of the course versus the online component of the course. So we were looking at how each of these different elements actually impacted student experiences. For the most part, the overwhelming majority of all the findings showed that in both hybrid and traditional settings, students had a preference for in-person experiences. The only exception throughout the whole data set, and this included a lot of other uh, aspects we just couldn't include here because we had way too many, I'd say, uh, would be general career prep, where we actually saw online in both traditional and hybrid experiences had a significant number of students that had a preference towards those for that general career prep. We kind of think that maybe that's related to like the changing world in terms of like more online experiences and more online offerings in terms of employment and such. And maybe it's more beneficial to have these technical experiences in like a general sense so that way you can better understand how to navigate this new system but other than that the other career aspects like medicine for instance again went back to the traditional in-person and hybrid in-person preference and then we also that same year while we were conducting that last study we just mentioned we also conducted a literature review this was kind of my introduction to this whole study in terms of like the um, uh, Chancellor Chair for Teaching Excellence Award. I had actually enrolled in a directed studies course and had the opportunity to conduct this literature review where we wanted to explore different metrics that are used for the quantification of teaching effectiveness, specifically within undergraduate human anatomy. So the main goal of this paper was to actually see what does it mean to be an effective anatomy instructor? So what are those actual elements and qualities that you want an anatomy instructor to have? Because it's a kind of a different experience, pedagogically speaking, in terms of how you actually can convey this information to students. Um, we also want to know specifically how can institutions work to quantify teaching effectiveness to best understand how the program is running to ensure that students are making uh, having an optimal experience while learning anatomy. And we want to look at the different types of pedagogical designs that are used to actually teach anatomy. 
So some of these include things like different peer-led learning, team-based learning, um, and so on. So there's a bunch of different ways that uh, institutions have determined to actually optimize their anatomy education by employing these different methods. Overall, we just found that by introducing these new teaching methods to optimize student engagement and just continually evaluating instructors to make sure that optimal education is occurring and incorporating peer-led learning styles all led to improved student experiences in anatomy. And this is typically across the board in both undergraduate and professional programs, such as in like medical education. Um, most of the literature we found too was conducted in professional programs such as medical schools, and there's very limited literature in specifically undergraduate programs for anatomy. So we felt like this was a very necessary project for expanding that um, data that's existing in the literature. Thanks, Nick. And that uh, sort of brought us into our second anatomy symposium as well, uh, where we wanted to look at some of the impacts that our research was, was sort of investigating and we wanted to share it. Um, and, and we think that students found uh, this to be quite interesting too. And, and we started to get more community members involved. Um, and to, to sort of go with the flow of everything we were doing, we did this hybrid. We had online and in-person symposium, so it was fun. Uh, we went from sort of online only to a kind of combo effect uh, where we had an online component where people could tune in through Teams if they wanted to. Uh, me in particular, because I had COVID at the time. so. You know, that's that's fun. Um, and we also had in-person individuals who were there to, to see some of the work and, and hear some of the speakers in person. So we had that option and it was a I, I hear it was a lovely time. Um, at least it was for me from home. That's another story. Anyway, that brings us to 2023 and something more recent, um, more recent in terms of. Actually, more of Nick's work. Um, so at this point, Nick, you've you've been sort of backtracking and going, wow, all right, this is what these guys were up to and you're doing directed reading studies and now it's your chance to shine. You have ideas and we're excited about these ideas and you're going to tell us about what you did. Yeah, so for this recent study, we wanted to investigate how uh, like the peer led program in terms of incorporating the anatomy volunteers into this uh, laboratory could actually impact students. And we did this specifically by looking at something called a supplemental instruction. So we typically have these things called exam review sessions that we would host prior to major course assessments where we just invite all the students in the course to come and and have an extra study time in the lab. So this is something known as supplemental instruction because it's outside of the regular course hours. And we found that a lot of students would all take advantage of this uh, time and we typically have like a high number of attendants. So we want to see how we could actually assess the role of peer leaders in these environments. So one way we did this was by actually having two different types of um, sessions that were hosted during these periods that were known as structured and unstructured sessions. Mind you, we didn't advertise this to students, but the structured sessions were where the peer leaders could actually support the students and answer any of their questions that they may have regarding content, help them explain, have content explained to them and so on and so forth. Whereas the unstructured sessions, those ones were specific to independent learning. The peer leaders were present as well, but they were only able to answer questions related to like like uh, administrative kind of stuff, I would say. So like when the exams are like how much time they would have for the exam, how many questions would be on the exam, et cetera, but they couldn't answer any co uh, content based questions to keep the study like the review period as independent as possible for independent learning. Um, so by doing this, we want to see whether there was any preference that students would have for the structured versus the unstructured sessions. We want to see how that these sessions could actually influence the academic outcomes of students. And we want to see if the students had any shift in perceptions of the anatomy program from these sessions. So some of the kind of findings that we found were students did have a preference for the structured sessions compared to the unstructured. But there was no difference between the two courses that we have. So that's musculoskeletal anatomy and systems anatomy. Um, we found that among the MSK students uh, that there was actually an increase in uh, their feelings of preparedness to write a major course assessment following attendance to these sessions. Uh, whereas in systems anatomy, there was still an increase, but it wasn't a significant difference from the initial because we did a pre post analysis in uh, the survey. Uh, then we also did the same thing for seeing how beneficial students believe 
that SI will be to their understanding of anatomy content. So we had a pre-survey before they attended the sessions and then a post-survey afterwards. There was no significant difference in both cohorts for that um, perceptive difference. The only thing is that we noticed that both samples were actually significantly more positive. So because they were above that liquid scale score of five, so they were and they remained within the positive region. So that was a good sign because there was a baseline positive perception of it, which we wanted to see. Um, we also found that time attending SI sessions actually impacted student grades. So we noticed that there was kind of this Goldilocks effect actually in terms of there's kind of like the right amount of time to be spending at these sessions because students that were spending way too much time, they necessarily didn't perform better because maybe they were just trying to overcompensate or something. Whereas the students who spent less time also didn't perform as well. And it was actually more broad, like wide ranging kind of. In terms of the highest performance, we noticed that it was within that kind of middle ground in terms of attendance. So like the 30 to 60 and 60 minute range. And those typically yield the best results within these sessions. Uh, we also ended up using generative artificial intelligence to conduct thematic and sentiment analysis on the survey responses from students. So we designed a protocol using ChatGPT where we actually inputted a lot of the student responses through our survey to assess specific aspects of the um, their uh, responses and the freeform responses. And we would prompt ChatGPT with the questions that the students were expected to at, like answer. And then we would include all those uh, responses. Then we'd have it look uh, at each of the responses and then provide a corresponding uh, numerical value for the sentiment analysis to determine whether the statement would be positive or negative. And we made sure that we would go through and like actually clean to make sure that the data that it was producing was actually representative of what we were seeing and like we cross-referenced it. And then for the thematic analysis, we wanted to have ChatGPT actually group the different um statements it was analyzing and produce different themes like so coded themes in reference to each thing that was being mentioned so we ended up breaking this down into three categories so there was knowledge and learning future careers and feedback that we found from each of their responses and um we yeah i can share the prompt afterwards um and then we actually just broke it down further into the specific um categories that were actually identified and we ended up like um, that's the word I'm looking for, like kind of putting them all together in their different settings and then seeing if there was any overlap between them, just thus the Venn diagram. And that kind of, you know, brought us to uh, sharing our results. So uh, where are we going to share this? Uh, clearly, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Smith went to Washington uh mr wilson also did and uh we went to the anatomy connected conference this was used to be part of experimental biology that sort of ended now the anatomy association uh the american anatomy association does its own little anatomy conference i say little it's huge it's massive it's being hosted in toronto in like a week and a half um which we'll be sharing some of our other results there as well but that's another story um so with this uh nick was able to actually share some of this amongst um, many, 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 many others, um, and and you got quite a coded response, Nick. So there was some some genuine interest in, in in being able to share how you know these these sort of structured sessions uh, with peer educators, what sort of impact they had, and and there was a lot of interest in the whole program. Um, and once again, we did another anatomy symposium, um, and then we decided, you know what, we're, we're we're on a high note. Let's let's put up let's drop uh, some swag. And, and, and you know, we had to get some cool backpacks going. So we also uh, started doing that and it's been fun. It, you know, why, why not uh, highlight some of our successes and, and show how this program has, has genuinely grown as well. So uh, on top of all that, that sort of brings us to our, our, our current trajectory and what we've been, we've been doing um, with our lab manuals. We've been actually taking a lot of the work that we've been doing um, and, and we're creating slightly more interesting ways to help share some of the information. We actually use some of our grant money to hire a student illustrator. And with that student illustrator, we took some of the principles that we've been learning, some of the concepts about like, okay, how, you know, how best to learn. Um, let, let's animate some of this stuff. Um, so we created Origin Man 
for origin and insertion of muscles, he goes out and he's got a grappling hook he attaches to things to show and demonstrate that a little bit easier. And it makes it easier to talk about and helps illustrate how muscles work and how they function over a joint. So students found that pretty interesting so far. Um, you know, explanations of different perhaps cell structures like an osteon. Uh, to me, it, it always seemed like Venice. So why not make an osteon look like Venice? Um, and, and just having someone actually illustrate some of the concepts that we might talk about um, and actually customize some of those illustrations to make learning a little bit more reflective of, of our approaches and, and what we're doing uh, makes it a little bit easier to, to sort of discuss that. So um, that's been integrated into our lab manuals so far, and we continue to improve things as we've been learning and picking up on these. Um, whatever results we end up getting, we, we sort of end up having this discussion of, OK, cool, this is neat. This is new. We didn't maybe we weren't as aware of this or we didn't think it had that much of an impact. But if it does, we need to integrate this. And if we thought something, you know, oh, this is change is going to be great. Um, and, and data is showing us that it's not. It's like, well, I guess we can focus on other things elsewhere and not worry so much about this. So it's been it's been good in terms of how we've been able to adapt and, and we continue to adapt our program to sort of meet these these kinds of new expectations that we now have learned how things should go. So uh, once again, we are being uh, invited, I suppose, uh, after applying to, to show our work and showcase our work at, an, at the anatomy conference. Uh, we're going to Toronto, so not quite Washington, Nick. Uh, the flight won't be as expensive. Actually, maybe it will. Who knows? It's Toronto. Um, and we're also hosting another symposium again on Saturday the 16th. Uh, for this symposium, we're, we actually want to bring some people who are, you know, in careers right now, other professionals, other even faculty members uh, who can tell or, or talk to students about, hey, this is the career I'm in. This is how anatomy has impacted my career. The sort of foundational knowledge that you learn in anatomy, this is how it can be used to do all these lovely, wonderful things outside of just medicine and nursing. So we've got some OTs, we've got some, um, I think we have some like ergon ergonomists. Uh, coming in. So again, it's just it's just a nice way to talk about, hey, all the stuff that you're learning that we say is so critical and so vital. Let's talk about how how cool it can be um, in terms of careers. So our volunteer program, you know, is continuing to, to grow and expand. Uh, we now get over 100 applicants um, typically uh, whenever we, we sort of open things up. Students are genuinely interested in the experiences they have with their peers who are teaching them they like it they want to come back to the lab they want to continue doing this so it's been it's been really interesting our lab manuals the the sort of guides that we provide for students they're continuing to evolve we we sort of notice different changes and we think hey we can make this better so there's always these the sort of new inter new iterations that keep coming in um and you know to to sort of put all together we're actually in the process of putting together a lab manual in our own textbook based on how we do things so the content is all there. The, the knowledge is there. It's just a matter of how can we best apply it to our students so that they succeed? Um, how can we integrate it with our current um, methods of, of learning and teaching? So that's been interesting, and that's sort of where we have um, kind of come full circle with our CCTE grant. Uh, so thanks for the money. Uh, you know, that was nice. In any case, uh, we're very, very thankful for the support from CPI, uh, for the Chancellor's Chair. Um, we've had some amazing help from different faculties, uh, from McMaster as well, um, and through the use of their cadaver lab that we have on campus, the Niagara Regional Campus. Um, and certainly the American Association for Anatomy has helped showcase a lot of the work that we're doing um, and has kind of helped spread the good word, so to speak. Um, so we are very grateful. And, um, you know, here's here's just a quick snapshot um, I think I'm holding pizza during the snapshot. So Perky Martin doing his thing, just yeah. Anyway, um, we're, we're just grateful. So um, you know, we have a huge team of people that work with us, and um, we're just really appreciative of having this opportunity. Um, and we hope we've done good by all of you.